So last week we looked at a topic called why worship? Why worship? And so what we're trying to do is almost like in America they have this thing called 101, which is kind of going back to basics. But we're just looking at why worship? And uh, this week uh, we're going to look at who we worship. Who we worship. Now worship's a, a really important topic because whoever we are, doesn't matter who we are, we all worship something. That is because there's something that is a priority to each one of us in our lives that we're going to pursue, hang on to, give our time for, our energy and resources to, along with our passion. And so what we saw last week was that, a, that worship is a life given over to something or someone. It's not just an event. It's kind of a lifestyle. It affects your whole life. So another thing that's really interesting is that worship is not exclusively a religious thing. Even atheists worship. They have priorities. They, think they, they have things that they give their lives for. And we also saw last week that anyone or anything can be worshipped. But the thing is, what you worship will have a different impact on your life depending on what it is. Now, while God made all things good, he also gave humanity this gift of free will so that we choose to be in relationship with him and know him or not. And so in this gift of free will we've been given, we choose what we worship for good or for ill. Having said that, free will doesn't mean that there's a lack of expectation on God's part regarding who or what we worship. In choosing not to worship God, we will therefore live in the consequences that we do in this world. So worship is about where our heart is, what our lives are lived out for, in our chosen priorities, and our attitudes and our behaviors. But the Bible teaches, and that's what we're looking at, the Bible teaches that there's only kind of one worship that brings real freedom, life, and genuineness. All other worship, it seems to indicate very clearly, is going to fall short and bring a dissatisfaction and ultimately a self-destruction. Well, why is that? Well, because in everything around us that we can see and know about, except for God, everything is finite, which means it's not going to last. It's eventually going to wear out. It's going to decay as time goes on. And so while many things can seem attractive and enduring next to God, they're nothing. Because God is eternal and outside of time. He's the source of all things. All that he created was good. And he's not just created in the way that we might make things. When we create, when we do things, we use the substance around us. We use what he made. When God created, we see in the Bible, he created out of nothing. That's phenomenal. He spoke and created things. He spoke and light came into being. Planets, time, seasons, living things all came into being. And while humanity was created from and formed from the dust of the ground and given life when he breathed his breath into Adam, we see this amazing comparison between us and God, as the psalmist writes in Psalm 90, verse 2. He says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In other words, you are eternal. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. It's quite a comparison, isn't it? A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. This is a majestic, awesome creator that we're talking about. But the choice of humanity to turn away from God, to not listen and choose other things over God, created things. The Bible teaches is what brought death and destruction into the world for all that was good. 
Creation became corrupted, and like anything tainted and corrupted going off tangent, the vicious cycle continues getting worse until we need something to correct it and redeem it. And that's the message of the good news of Jesus. He came to correct and redeem that which was corrupted and tainted and get it back on course. We saw in this passage last week from Romans 1, 25, it says, they, humanity, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is to be forever praised. Amen. And so that is the option that we have is to buy into what the Bible says is a lie or into the truth, to buy into worshipping things or the creator. And even as those who might follow Jesus, we still in our attitudes have to watch what we don't buy into that and put other things above God. It can be easy to do. God's made everything for a purpose. So in worshipping him, and we said this last week, in worshipping him, we find our purpose for life. Revelation verse 4, there's going to be quite a few little quick passages of scripture. Revelation 4.11 there's this picture of worship in heaven. And everyone worshiping says this, you are worthy, Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being or exist. So we're looking today at who we worship as followers of Jesus. Who is God? Who is it we're called to worship? Why is he worth worshipping? What are some of the attributes of God, his nature, his character? An attribute is something that is true about him. When we talk about God, when we talk about the attributes of God, we're trying to understand and describe who God is, what God is like, what kind of God is he? Because of who God is, being eternal and existing before anything was, then we have to recognize that he's precisely the right person to be worshiping and settle the fact that we'll never ever fully comprehend who he is. And that really is what God should be about. Something bigger than us, someone bigger than us. And yet in this enormity, we recognize that in his loving graciousness, he's made himself personally known to us in various ways throughout time, through his creation, through his interaction with humanity and what he's said and done, through his revealed word, and ultimately through his son, Jesus. He is beyond understanding and description. And yet, Something in us longs to know him and understand. Something longs to connect with this eternal being who has set eternity in our hearts. To give something worth needs recognition of its value. So in looking at God's attributes, his character, his nature, it helps inform us of just that, his worthship, from where we get worship, worthship. Author, teacher, and preacher Francis Chan said this, many spirit-filled authors have exhausted the thesaurus in order to describe God with the glory he deserves. His perfect holiness by definition assures us that our words cannot contain him. Isn't it a comfort to worship a God we cannot exaggerate? How many of us exaggerate things in life? We exaggerate what we've done. We cannot exaggerate God. We can't find the words to describe what he's done and who he is. I love, I love that. He's not a blob. He's not a force. He's the supreme being. And all we can try and do is find some words to describe what we can of who he is that will help us in giving worth to him, in giving worship. I find doing that particularly helpful to me. It's good to think about expanding our vocabulary of words. In the Bible, there's a phrase used by one of the songwriters 
in the book of Psalms, and it says this, Psalm 34, verse 3. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's give his name praise. I've always found that there's a slightly different translation in the English Standard Version. ESV says this, and I find it a more helpful and descriptive way of putting it. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord with me. Now, to magnify, as you know, is to make something bigger. You, you get the magnifying glass, you make it bigger. That's not what it's saying here. Rather, what it's saying is, let's get a bigger understanding of who he is, a bigger view. Let's enlarge our perspective. Have you ever been somewhere where you were promised a specific view? Uh, uh, we, we've been to a few places, and I can remember on one occasion booking because it had a very specific sea view, and when we got there, there was no sea view. So I complained, asked for a different room, and we got a sea view if you kind of bent around the balcony to get there. And off the edge. And off the edge, yes. So it was marginally better. But the interesting thing was, if we stayed there, we would have had a limited perspective. But when we left the building and went outside and walked down to the beach, our perspective changed of what was already there. Our view became bigger. But we were the ones that had to move. The view didn't move. We had to move. And so magnifying the Lord is about changing our posture and our perspective of God, which is crucial in helping us worship. God doesn't change in our worship of Him. As we magnify the Lord, He doesn't change, we change as we change our posture and perspective to see more of who He is. And the more we see, the more in all we become. Last year in Scotland, we stayed by a lock, I've got some pictures, with a gorgeous view. And I would love looking at the landscape. Mist would come in, rain would come in, sun would come in. It was like a living landscape. And so we gaze, and you can see it was a partial view, but it's actually a 17-mile lock. It was more than what we could see there. And then we went out onto the beach area. And uh, we went there to see a bit more, to see around the corner. We built a fire to cook on, and I kind of got captivated by the fire and the view. And I sat and looked at the beauty around. And then, as we were out walking one day, uh, I saw these beautiful flowers. They were tiny flowers on the ground. And so what I had to do was change my posture, and I got down on my hands and knees to look at them. And I wanted to take photographs because I wanted to see what they were like. And I took a photograph and this was something that I saw. Now, I'd have walked right by that. I would not have engaged with it. I would not have had any sense of awe unless I changed my perspective and posture to see it. And so often with God, we limit God, we box Him up, and we miss so much of who He is. But in magnifying God, we begin to explore the vastness of His nature, His character, and we, ad as, uh, and we adjust our uh, perspective, our posture, we get informed, we get encouraged, and we get changed by what we see and experience. That's worship. Over the years, I've encouraged people to write an A to Z list of of words that describe God. And I'm in the process of starting that again. I want to refresh that for myself. You always have trouble with Z and X, you know. But, but I, I want to find more words in my vocabulary to speak to God, to, to tell God what I think about Him. And so as I go through some of these today, the language of the Bible verses being used are framed in a language of praise and worship. So we just take the one eternal. We just looked at that. He is self-existing. He needs nothing else to sustain him. That's our God. And that's where his name, I am, the one who was, who is, who is to come, covering eternity, Yahweh or Jehovah, that's where it comes from. 
In the New Testament, there's this verse in Colossians 1 verse 17 that speaks about God and Jesus saying, He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. It's interesting in the book of Revelation again, which I referred to earlier, it gives a, a glimpse of worship in heaven and, and as they're worshipping they cry out this in Revelation 4 verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come. Speaking of eternity, was, is, is to come. In other words, he's also immutable, which means he never changes. Malachi 3 verse 6, God says, I the Lord do not change. Everything around us is changing, isn't it? We change, people we know change, even to the point of things becoming unreliable, but he doesn't change, which is amazing, isn't it? That's why we can depend on him. That's why we can put our hope and our trust in him. When I'm praying, I find that so important for me to realize in the face of everything that's uncertain that I face. When I wake up, that's what my faith rests on, knowing he never changes. He's utterly dependable, bringing peace, even when I don't understand it. Another one, he's the all-sufficient one, and he's also self-sufficient. He's all-sufficient, name, his name is Jehovah Jireh. Romans 11 verse 30 says, 36 says this, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. It's all about him. He's complete. He has no needs. He, no, he needs no one. He doesn't need us. He wants us. That's so different, isn't it? He doesn't need you. He wants you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to enjoy all that he is. He invites us into that place of knowing and to live from that place. And he can meet all our needs too, as he said. He is all that we need. That is his love in action. And again, that's been crucial for me to know in my worship of God, to know he is all I need. He's the sufficiency I need. Because things around me become exhausted. I become resourced. Resources become exhausted. Finances, relationships become exhausted. But even when they do, and I go to God, I find he fills me up. See, we all have needs. But the question is, what do we do? And where do we go to to have those needs met? We can call on his name. The God of provision the self-sustaining one, the God of sufficiency. We can declare the truth of this. We can call on his resources. How about another one? God is incomparable and unequaled. Incomparable and unequaled. There's no one like him. There's no one like him in who he is or in what he does. Psalm 86 verse 8, it says, Among the gods, among all those things that are worshipped, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. And so settle in your heart that nothing can compare with God, with Jesus. And don't settle for anything less than that. There's a, a wonderful song that says it, it's your beautiful beyond description. I'm just going to sing it for you a second. And you may know it. <clears throat> Beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp? infinite wisdom who can fathom the depth of your love 
You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. There's just something amazing when you begin to think about who God is, His greatness, that He's incomparable. And I find when I do that, just worship comes out. I, I can't help myself. He's indescribable, and yet He knows me. He loves me. He's chosen me, and He's chosen you. Another thing is this, God is inscrutable, which means He's impossible to understand. He's unfathomable. He's unsearchable. He's past finding out as far as understanding Him goes. Isaiah 40 verse 28 says this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. In Romans 11.33, Oh, the depths of the riches and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. Again, I find this comforting to have someone way beyond me in my knowledge and understanding. It's not intimidating to me. It's actually very freeing. So many times I don't know what to think, but I know He knows. And when I see people around me who are cleverer than me, I can find that intimidating because I might have to defer to their knowledge and, and I have this question, can I trust them? Are they right? It's not I don't want to defer, I'm just am not sure. But with God, I know He's bigger. And He understands things I don't. And it's so good to be able to trust Him. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful with unlimited power. He can do whatever He wants. And while He does that, it will always line up with His character and what He said. He is the Lord Almighty. There's no one mightier than Him. Jeremiah 32 verse 17 says, Our Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Revelation 19 says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. This is our God. I want to be on His side. Well, good news. Romans 8 verse 31 says this, What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 37. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I'm so thankful I do not serve a powerless, created God, personal thing. I serve the Almighty God who does great things, who's made all things. So when I'm feeling overwhelmed, what I need to remember is who is with me, who is for me. The all mighty God. When we're facing great odds, there is someone we can be in relationship with who is greater. And that gives hope and should create praise within us. God's omnipresent, meaning He's everywhere. Doesn't mean that He's a tree or rock, but He is everywhere. And we had in the reading earlier from Psalm 139, that, that great verse in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. We can't escape Him. And that's a good thing. 
And God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything, the past, the present, the future, including what we're thinking at any moment. Again, in that psalm, it says, you search me, Lord, verse 1. You know me, you know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern my going out, my lying in, my lying down, you're familiar with all my ways. Before a word's on my tongue, you know it completely. He is incredible. A.W. Tozer said this, he said, this ought to bring deep comfort to Christians who struggle with loneliness and deep sorrow. This is a very real way God is always near us, closer than our thoughts. The knowledge that we're never alone calms the troubled sea of our lives and speaks peace to our soul. The Lord is near. He's close to the brokenhearted. And so, these are just a few things. We're going to look at some more. But I just want to give us a taste of what it is to think about who we worship. We can think about why we worship because there's a need in us. There's a desire for something. We want to give ourselves to something. But who do we worship? We worship an amazing God. A God of love, a God of power, a God of forgiveness, a God of nearness. So let's pray and then we're going to finish with a bit more worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come, presence of God, you would be here in this place right now. That we might become aware of your presence and your goodness. Help us to adjust our posture, our perspective. Help us to be able to move from the position we're in and see the vastness of who you are. To see the vastness of your great love. Come Holy Spirit.